Um, no, we did not pass those out. And nobody's online with it? Not yet. Okay. Um, 937. Oh. 39.45. Hmm? 39.45. Yeah. I did not get one. Oh, you did not. My apologies. It's because I said closest to you. Anybody? Anybody? Blessed God. 10,000 shares of mine. Without and within, and then we all meet. When sloth and indolence seize me, give me views of heaven. When sinners entice me, give me this relish of their ways. When sensual pleasures tempt me, purify me. When I desire more than possessions, help me to be rich toward me. When the vanities of the world ensnare me, let me not plunge into the guilt of me. We have remembered the dignity of my spiritual release. Never be too busy to attend to my soul. Never be so engrossed to come. And I neglect the things of eternity. Thus may I not only live, but work towards me. For my mind to write notions of religion, that I may not judge the goods in my wrong conceptions, nor measure my spiritual advances by the efforts of my mind. May I seek after the increase of the mind left to be an unreserved designation to thy work, after the extensive benevolence to my fellow creatures, and the patience and fortitude of my soul, after a heavenly disposition, after a concern that I may please thee with the public of God. Draw my soul to the limits of Christ, and let me trace the future of which thou hast observed. I let her look into the Holy Spirit's kingdom and feel a soul of earth for the sake of the kingdom. Any thoughts? Anything that jumps out at you? Convicts you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you always, you always, you just, you always feel like that. I was uh, uh, reading something recently about um, the um, about time and what creates time, and you know it was a kind of a thing on um, space travel and what um, traveling in space would be based on the data and research that they had from the. Um, satellites that they sent out and the um what's the one that just recently passed Pluto? Um it's, I forget, but I mean it had been launched like or something. Um and then they had another one that went to Jupiter and has done, you know, I, I forget what, what the names of them are, but anyway, it was just kind of interesting the study that they they did on uh, on time and our perception of time as humans here on Earth and um, what that what that kind of looks like and how time passes and how time passes in space that we can measure it based on our own what we know here and what we experience on earth but um but that it was uh, gravity that creates our perception of time it was just it was all very interesting some of it was kind of uh, theoretical but um but it was it was just kind of interesting that what it posits and makes you think about and um it sort of I mean, obviously god created time time is linear for us but for him it's 
It's not. Time is the omega, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and end. And he, he sees everything all at once as though it happens in a second, and you know, you can see that. And, and whereas we don't, because everything is you know, yesterday, today, or tomorrow. And for him, yesterday, today, and forever are the same thing. So it's kind of interesting. The same time, but an in image. I hadn't heard that before. I was written on a desk when I was in grade school. Somebody carved it in, in, in a, I don't know who did that, what grade school. Right, carving graffiti <laughs> into the desk and words of wisdom from some fourth grader or something. I don't know who did that. Say it again. Say it again. Time is but an image of eternity. It's good. Anybody else? Go home and cry over it. <laughs> <laughs> Would somebody like to open us in prayer? Is anybody online? No. What's wrong with Mary? I hope everything's all right. No, I, I talked to her last week, okay. and if they come to church, she can't get on. She doesn't have enough time to get online. Were they here this morning? Well, they might be coming later. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So she, she usually gets in and looks at it. Okay. On YouTube. Would somebody like to open us in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you that uh, you uh, have given us time so that we can measure things such as our lives and uh, we can uh, be organized through it. And yet, Lord, uh, you are infinite and you're, you are eternal. And uh, we look forward to the day that. Uh, we sit with you and uh, the others that have, have gone to be with you and that uh, time will, will really not have any place. It won't be the, the, the tyrant that it can be here. And we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us today as we continue to look at Deuteronomy. And we ask, Lord, that uh, uh, you help us to uh, understand uh, Dr. Godfrey and, and uh, uh, understand uh, the the significance of the history uh, that uh, that comes through your living word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to try each week to uh, give you a, uh, give you the scriptures that uh, he refers to uh, so that, you know, you're not having to flip through and, and do all that stuff. So, uh, so I, I gave you that. And um, I, I sort of messed up on the link when I sent it out. I said that we were doing the history of Deuteronomy. We were doing the God of Deuteronomy today. So uh, last week was the history. So let's uh, move on. Well, we take up our study of uh, Deuteronomy in chapter four today. We are uh, looking at this final chapter of the first uh, section of our step pyramid, the history section, chapter four is uh, rehearsing some of the history of uh, Israel as they're about to enter the promised land and is reiterating what the Lord uh, taught them at Horeb about the importance of avoiding idolatry. And uh, there at verse uh, 15, we really come to the central teaching of this fourth chapter. And you remember we've seen in Hebrew literature how important centers are much of the time. And uh, it begins with that uh, repeated word, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Um, you saw no form on the day when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Uh, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of and then he goes on to be very specific. He doesn't want to leave any room for doubt. Uh, he does not want any images made of him uh, that resemble human beings, uh, that resemble animals or birds or things that creep on the earth or fish that swim in the sea or sun or moon or stars. Have you got that? Um, none of these things are appropriate representations of God. And uh, he says, very interestingly, he says, 
those things, those created things, I gave to all people. And he doesn't really expand on that thought, but it's an intriguing thought when you think about it. What God is really saying to Israel is, as creator, I gave creation to everybody. But I'm giving myself to you. I'm your God. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And so the Lord is saying, not only is this a command that I give you, but it's a command with a real reason behind it. Um, you must not replace the creator with some part of the creation. It doesn't make any sense. But beyond not making any sense, it undermines the fundamental relationship that I have with you, my people. And part of what I want to do as we go through this study of Deuteronomy is, is to see that, that God is not, I think as we sometimes think of him in relation to the Old Testament law, God is not the great accountant in the sky with a ledger seeing how well we're doing on every little point. Uh, God is above all else a personal, saving, loving God, and he wants a personal relationship with his people. And all of these laws are designed to support that personal relationship that he has with people. If you go replacing him with an image of something he created, you've diminished him. But you've not only diminished him, but you have harmed the relationship he wants to have with you. And, and you've replaced him with, with something else. It's the great human temptation to replace God with something else. And we'll see as we go along that he warns people against the, um, the most particular things that we are inclined to replace him with. Um, we do that individually. We do that as churches. And he's warning here, don't do it. I want to be your God, uh, a God who has no image, who is not to be reduced to some part of his creation, but is to be appreciated uh, for the great creator God uh, that he is. He goes on in verse 20 to say, the Lord took you out of Egypt to be his own. And uh, then intriguingly, uh, he says again, Verse 23 of chapter 4, Take care, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now, we all know, don't we, that uh, the idea that God is a consuming fire is just an Old Testament idea. This is a trick question. This is to see if you're paying attention. Is it true that it's just an Old Testament idea that God is a consuming fire? No, because this very verse, Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, is quoted in Hebrews 12, verse 29. Uh, when the author of the letter to the Hebrews is talking about the importance of worship and the seriousness of worship and how we're to, to worship God with reverence and awe. That's a New Testament command, not an Old Testament command. It's also an Old Testament command. It's a New Testament command. Worship God with reverence and with awe. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. Quotes this verse from the Old Testament. Uh, there are a lot of people today who uh, want to say in church as well, it's a very different attitude in the New Testament from the Old Testament about worship. God was very serious and particular about worship in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, you can pretty much do what you want. It's not true. Be careful how you worship. Um, that's the message of the Scripture all the way through. Worship is a lot simpler in the New Covenant than it was in the Old, but it's no less serious. God is no less serious, and the relationship he wants with his people is no less serious and profound. And so uh, uh, here is one of the many places in Deuteronomy where we hear an echo in the New Testament that really deepens our understanding of that New Testament uh, teaching itself. And then we get down to verse uh, 25, 
And uh, here, too, is an important uh, part of Deuteronomy, an important teaching of Deuteronomy. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly, that really should be translated when you act corruptly. It would be nice if it were if, if this were uncertain. But really, this is not what Moses is teaching here. This is not the, uh, the instruction that Moses is giving here. And we'll see that picked up in more detail in Deuteronomy 28 when we get there. But Moses is really saying, I not only know the history past of God's people, but I know the history future of God's people. And I know what kind of a people you are, and I know the danger you're going to be in. And I have to warn you that when you act corruptly in future generations, there are going to be terrible consequences. And the terrible consequence is you're going to lose the land. There's going to be an exile. Uh, that's not a surprise that's going to come into the life of Israel. It's prophesied right here by by Moses, and that prophecy will be reiterated and expanded in Deuteronomy uh, 28. And so it, it's very important to see that Deuteronomy, in a variety of ways, is very much forward-looking. It's talking not only about the past and about the present, but it's communicating to Israel uh, to be aware that there are going to be great changes in their future, and they have to be prepared for that. They have to recognize what's going to happen. And we'll see in the very last chapter of, uh, of Deuteronomy that what is said is, uh, even though calamity is going to come upon Israel in the future for a time, yet God will raise up another prophet like Moses. And there is the uh, great prophecy of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament situation described in Deuteronomy was never going to be the end. It was never the fulfillment. Uh, the promised land had a great purpose, but the purpose of the promised land was preparatory to seeing the coming of the ultimate Messiah, the ultimate mediator, the true prophet, priest, and king, who would bring the new heaven and the new earth, not just a little bit of territory in the Near East. Uh, that's not what we're promised in the Scripture. The, what we're promised in the Scripture is the great day of, of, is coming when the whole earth will be renewed and the whole earth will belong to the people of God because that's what God intended from the beginning. So there's a, there's a real historical movement going on in Deuteronomy to cause the people to look forward uh, with confidence, with hope, with expectation about what's going to happen uh, in their future. And so this history is critical, and at the center of it always is this call to avoid idolatry. Um, it's very tempting to invest physical objects with spiritual power. Uh, it's very tempting. It's very satisfying to think there's a place I can go, there's a thing I can touch that will connect me to the divine. That's a pretty universal human experience. Um, some of you will know I'm a, a minister in a Dutch Reformed denomination. And in the Dutch Reformed churches, uh, unlike a lot of the Presbyterian churches, we have forms, we call them, for things. Um, that is, uh, uh, readings that the minister reads for baptism, for Lord's Supper for profession of faith. I think it's because the Dutch Reformed are gloomier than the Presbyterians and know that ministers are not be, to be trusted to get things right. <laughs> so you just give them something to read and they may be able to, to successfully uh, do that. And uh, interestingly, in uh, one of the old uh, communion forms, um, there's a list of gross sins. And uh, the form says uh, anyone practicing these sins are not to come to the Lord's table unless they repent of these sins. And in that list of gross sins, uh, interestingly enough, one of the sins to be avoided is praying to saints. Well, this form was written in the 16th century. Uh, uh, people were just coming out of Roman Catholicism. 
And there were many people still devoted to the saints. So I knew a, a minister who was reading this form, and he got into it and starts reading the, the list of gross sins and reads the one about not praying to saints. And he, he said, I remember thinking to myself, this is dumb. You know, this is so old-fashioned. Why are we doing this? And he said, after the service, a person came up to him and said, thank you so much for that. I was still praying to saints. I'd never really been able to break with that. Well, it's, it's a tendency of the human heart to invest something physical with, with spiritual presence and power because it makes life easier for us. We're, we are visually uh, centered. And so the Lord really warns us about that. Um, Paul, in a sense, I think, echoes this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And and that's really reflected there in uh, chapter 4 um, uh, of Deuteronomy as a as a great call to the spiritual character of our God. And then in one of those moves that uh, sometimes surprises and confuses us, uh, at the end of chapter 4, verses 41 through 43, we have a statement about the establishment of three cities of refuge on the east side of the Jordan for people who are guilty of manslaughter. See, th- these are these head scratchers. Uh, why? Why? Well, I think part of the reason is that um, Moses wants to make the point that we are all sinners, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, and God makes a provision for sinners. Um, in the ancient world, uh, there was, uh, in the Middle East and in many places, Uh, a profound sense of blood feuds. If you kill somebody in my family, I have to kill you. And those blood feuds would go on through generations because, of course, when I kill somebody in your family, then you have to kill somebody in my family, and back and forth it goes forever. And this provision says we want to end that in Israel, Uh, particularly in the cases where someone has accidentally killed someone else not intentionally, not an act of murder, but there needs to be a place of refuge for such a person so he won't be killed by the relatives and establish a back-and-forth blood feud in Israel. So even these things make sense as we think about them as God wanting to establish a people of harmony and peace and love um, in the land that he is giving them. So in Deuteronomy 4, we see a fair bit of law, but it's very much in the context of history. And uh, then as we move on to chapter 5, uh, we're moving on to a, uh, a section that we find in our uh, step pyramid here, the beginning of the section that I've called warnings. Uh, five and a half chapters, 5 through 10, verse 11, of, of various ways of warning Israel about the importance of, of keeping the law. And um, on one level, we could say um, these chapters are remarkably repetitive. Uh, They say the same things in a lot of um, ways over and over again. But they come at them with slightly different angles. Um, uh, Chapter 5 and chapters 9 and 10 are looking at the warnings from the perspective of Sinai. And then chapter 6 looks at the warnings from the perspective of the family. And chapter 7 looks at the warnings from the perspective of Israel's relationship to the world. And then chapter 8 looks at the warnings from the perspective of Israel as a nation. And so God, I think, is saying uh, the law may always be the same, but that law uh, comes with us in various relationships that we have as we live. And and the law doesn't become irrelevant in those relationships. The the law uh, remains the great guide uh, that we need and uh, the great help uh, that God in mercy has given us. And so in chapter 5, Moses 
uh, very deliberately goes back to um, uh, Mount Sinai and uh, reiterates uh, the commandments that God gave there, reiterates the summary uh, of the commandments that God gave there. So in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have the second statement in the Old Testament of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. And uh, you'll be glad to learn that the Ten Commandments are the same. It's the same commandments uh, in both places. God has not changed his law. But there is a significant change. Not in the commandment, but in the reason for the commandment. And that is to be found in the fourth commandment, um, the commandment to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, in the uh, record of the Ten Commandments in Exodus, um, the reason we are to keep the Sabbath day holy is because of what God did at creation. You should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In six days, God created the heavens and earth and all the, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So it's... It's a creation ordinance, as our Reformed forebears used to say. It's a command grounded in creation. That's what Exodus 20 wants to emphasize. Uh, and that's important to know. Um, so I think it's very important for us uh, Christians today to know because there are lots and lots of teachers who mean well who say, well, you know, the Sabbath commandment was just for the Jews. It has nothing to do with the church. And now that uh, the church has come, um, the church is free to worship any time, to serve God on any day, because we are not bound to one day. One day was just for the Jews, not for us. Well, that's a problem when you think about it, because Exodus 20 doesn't say that God gave the Sabbath commandment to the Jews because they were Jews. It says God gave the Sabbath commandment to all people because they were creatures. And uh, I think that's, that's really important for us. Uh, uh, the whole history of the church has recognized that God set aside one day as a holy day. And uh, the history of the church has said uh, in the Old Covenant, it was the last day of the week, Saturday, and in the New Covenant, to mark Christ's resurrection from the dead, it's the first day of the week. And uh, uh, John seems to teach that in, in Revelation 1, verse 10, where he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Well, what's the Lord's day? If all days are alike in the New Covenant, as some people argue, there can't be a Lord's day. But John says there is a Lord's day. And it's intriguing the, the exact form of the Greek there, um, because the Greek is, it's not the day of the Lord, it's the Lord's day. It's the dominical day. It's an adjectival form. And the only other place the word Lord is used ad adjectivally in the New Testament is in 1 Corinthians 11 about the Lord's Supper. There are many suppers, but there's only one Lord's Supper. And so there are many days, but the Lord's Day has a specificity to it. And we see from apostolic practice, they meet for worship on the first day of the week. And so I think the church has always rightly taught that in the resurrection of Christ, the Sabbath, instead of coming at the end of time, comes at the beginning of our week. Because we already rest in the fulfillment of Christ's resurrection. Well, that's a long Sabbath argument in a very brief amount of time. Um, but that's what we find in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, a day is set aside by God as creator. And, and what he means by that is, um, not only do we need that time to fellowship with him, but we need that time to rest. Um, a, a culture that has no time for rest is in a lot of trouble. And a culture that has no time for God is in a lot of trouble. And that's increasingly where we find ourselves. It's, it's curious to me as a historian how uh, many churches that 50, 60 years ago were very strict about Sunday have sort of given up on Sunday altogether. And I don't think the church is any better off for it in any case. 
Sabbath because of creation in Exodus 20. But here in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, the reason given is because of God's redemptive work. Uh, Deuteronomy 5 verse th uh, 13, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. So far the same as Exodus 20. That your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So it's not only because of creation we keep the Sabbath day, but because, it's, but because of redemption we keep the Sabbath day. Um, we used to be slaves who had to work at our master's bidding all the time. And God delivered us from that slavery. And God gave us rest. And so one day a week we rest in him to remember him as the rescuer of slaves. And what we'll see is that this has resonance through the, the, the whole of Deuteronomy and through the whole Old Testament. If we are to rest and our servants are to rest, and the stranger with, it, with us is to rest, it changes the whole character of, of society and of relationships. Um, our relationships are no longer just economic, um, but there's a communal spirit of mutuality. We were all slaves. One of the great problems America wrestles with is the legacy of slavery, that some were slaves and some were not. But here we're taught our legacy, our history, is that we are all slaves, and therefore we're all equal, and therefore we're all to rest uh, before God and to enjoy his blessing. So the Lord is uh, warning his people uh, a great deal about himself. He's the rescuer. But he's also warning us a lot about ourselves, who we are, how we're to understand ourselves, and how we're to understand our relationship with one another. If you remember one of the things uh, out of Deuteronomy 17 about the king, he was not to lift himself in pride above his brothers. Why is that? Because we were all slaves in Egypt. No nobility came out of Egypt. Only slaves came out of Egypt, and it creates a community of mutuality. Well, we need to stop there, but we'll go on looking at uh, the warnings that we find that come out of the law of God next time. <coughs> Any thoughts? Uh, you have on the I'm going to get used to it, but I can't get it to work. So um, just ignore this for the moment. <laughs> um, so, because I want to get your feedback before we get into this. So is there anything that he said in there that uh, particularly caught your interest or you didn't like what he said? The Lord's Day. The Lord's Day? And how it's not paid attention to mm -hmm. much anymore. Um, it's not our day. It is the Lord's day. You know, say that the reason that we have the problems that we do today in society um, is because of abortion. But I think, and I, I don't, I'm not saying that that's not, not it, but I think the fact that the church gave up the Sabbath is really uh, a key to the issues that we're having today because um, you never saw anybody out riding their bikes during the morning on, 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 on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day. You never saw that 40 years ago because people were in church. But about 40 years ago is when uh, 
when all this happened with the blue laws that, uh, that you had that said uh, places had to be closed. And um, so I, I really think, to me, to my thinking, it's a combination of things, obviously, but it's the idea that we gave up something that was that, that God, you know, God speaks to that in the Ten Commandments more than any other commandment. You know, there's more to that as, as he explains it. So there's an importance attached to it. And, uh, you know, so I think that I think that you're right. The Lord's Day is one thing that has been uh, has been neglected. And I think to the detriment, not just to the church, but to society itself. Uh, to, because, you know, um, trying to think if it was one of the countries that was really trying to get away from, uh, it was either a communist country or it might, have been, I don't know if it was the Nazis, but uh, they went to a 10 day work week. Yeah, they tried to go to a 10 day work week and it didn't work because you need, you work for six days. God created the world in six days and he rested in the sun. We're creating his image. So we need to rest. We don't work well if we don't rest. You know, if you don't get your sleep, you don't work well. You know, and, and so even overnight, you know, you, you need to be able to, uh, to rest. But you need that day of rest where you focus. You focus on the things of the Lord. What do you do on the Sabbath? You do acts of mercy. You know, um, and there's been, you know, all kinds of uh, all kinds of things over the years as to as to what you can do uh, on the Sabbath. What is acceptable to do on the Sabbath? Um, uh, there, uh, there were there were controversies back in in a time of uh, when Westminster was being written about. What you could do on the Sabbath? Can you do recreational things? You know, some people feel that you can't do anything recreationally. That you, you know, now I never felt like you know, that you couldn't go out and kick a ball around or throw the ball around with your kids because you're you're doing something with them. It's it, it's it's something. But there are people that would say that was the wrong way to look at it. Um, so there's different interpretations, but the bottom line is you need to set the day aside differently, differently. Um, so great point, great point, uh, Jane. We're glad you're here today. It's providential. Uh, <laughs> there will be more and more uh, technology and everything else is being made as a slave. So. Yes, yes. Yeah, isn't it interesting? And I, I think this gets back to the idea of idolatry. Uh, uh, um, isn't it interesting that the things that we wind up getting, um, we pervert? You know, um, getting knowledge is not a bad thing. The internet, in and of itself, is not a bad thing, but it's how the internet winds up being used that winds up being sinful. So somebody gets something, you know, it was like with TV, with movies, you know. Generally speaking, this is not, you know, that's not a bad thing. But when people take movies and put perversions out there, then it's become something that is wrong. And um, and, and it's it, it comes to this idea, and this, you know, we, we talk about idolatry, and we talk about it in relationship to God. And all idolatry has relationship to God. Because what did he say about idolatry is? It takes away the creator. You take what you take. That's our focus. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got you got this little bit over here. You take one inch, or you take one inch. You take one inch. Right. You take one inch. Right. He, he um. It's, uh, it, as he says here, it's the perennial temptation of the people of God and must be fought against and repented of by God's people in every generation. We make idols, and we've talked about this, we make idols out of everything. We try to make an idol out of everything. But what is an idol doing? 
The first thing it is, it's doing, it, it, it um, I'm trying to remember the word he used in there, but it's basically, it does a disservice. Is there two S's in disservice? It does a disservice to God because it diminishes him. It diminishes him because once we make something an idol, we're taking our eyes off of him. So it diminishes him. And um, so it's a disservice. What, what was the second thing that they said that, uh, that he said? That um, distraction. No, uh, it's diminishing. It's diminishing. Yeah. And then what, what's the other thing that you said in there? Not only that it diminishes God, but um, I'm trying to find it. Um, I've got it. <laughs> I've got it. It replaces. There you go. So it, it's a disservice because it dis diminishes God and it replaces God. Um, once we make something an idol, it, it, it's... So that's why if we tie that to the Sabbath, what happens? We make something an idol. Now, when the stores stayed open, what did they realize was going to happen? Shopping was going to become an idol. Okay, so what did it do? It did a disservice to God because it diminished the relationship, diminished what we were commanded to do, and it replaced it. Because people go out and they do things on the Sabbath that um, that diminish the relationship with God. But yeah, you know, and and I'm not anywhere close to a strict what we would call a strict sanitarian. Um, I enjoy the football games. I, 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 I kind of. Especially Pittsburgh. I spend, what, there's no other. <laughs> <laughs> what other team? <laughs> yeah. you know, it, the only other teams are the ones that are playing against that day. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, and, and even, uh, you know, our, our good friend R.C. Sproul, you know, he was, he, he not only was a sports fan, he was a trivia fan. And he used to tell his students, come in and bring a trivia question into me that you think I can't answer. <laughs> and the, I think there was one time he said that somebody brought something to him that he couldn't answer. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, so, so we can take these things and we can take, you know, we have these discussions about the technology that we use here in the church and what, we need to, to be aware of so that the technology doesn't take away from what we're supposed to be about. So we've set things up so that we try to be very effective in what we're doing technolo technolo technologically. We're trying to be as effective, but we don't want that to diminish the fact that we are relational in our churches. We are uh, we're, we connect with each other, and we have to do that face-to-face. -face. I'm struggling with that right now with my work with SCA because I've had Zoom meetings with kids. But trying to find that time right now to meet in person is difficult schedule-wise, but it's also difficult because we don't know if we're going to have a place to meet because of the pandemic. I think we're getting around that. And, and that's wondering, but we, we are created where he says never fill the symbol. We need each other. Right. We need to interact. Right. And when you get away, it's it's not good. And then it's so anyway, this we basically answered this question. Um the, uh, uh, God's commands and warnings were against idolatry. Because what happened? What happened when Moses was up on the mountain? What did the people do? They created an idol. They created an idol. What do you? Um, he, he talked about the different things. You know, the Roman Catholic Church 
as relics. They're idols. You know, um, and, and, and it's it's incredible. I mean, the numbers of relics that that they that they have, and the things that they give, you know, the the uh, a, a piece of wood of the cross of Christ. You know, that that cross might have been recycled. You know, <laughs> I might have put it in a bin. You know. I mean, we don't know that, and yet, yet people will go and say, "Wow, well, well, you know," and and we even get a depiction of that in in the uh, Luther movies, because his uh, advocate, um, what, was his, what was his name, Frederick, Frederick, yeah, he wanted to have the most and best relics of anybody, and. Uh, uh, you know, and, and so it was something that, that was fought against. Now, some people go to the go to a, an even greater extreme, go to the other way. They don't want anything. And that was one of the problems when Luther did that. People were stuck in front of churches, breaking windows. Yes. Says, no, yes. That. Yeah, that's right. So what happens? You go the other direction, and and and, and you. Trying to get rid of things, you know, it's 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 just crazy. Um, that, that what we have, uh, what we do. All right, I tried to make these things bigger. <laughs> In Deuteronomy uh, 4, 25 to 28, but size, that God's people will, will act corruptly and be exiled from their land. What do you think about that? What, what about, how, did, how did Moses... No, that people were going to act corruptly. That's what they've been doing all along. That's what they that's what they've done all along. You know, he gets the he gets the Ten Commandments and they make an idol. And what's the first thing? You know, what's the first things in the Ten Commandments? Don't make an idol. Yeah. And and before before the ink is dry, uh, the the idol is made. Um and and, and uh he uh, the, he talked about the fact that that they came out of slavery, and how how does that connect with us? You know, we know you know physically the Egyptians were slaves. What are we slaves to? Sin, Sin yeah. Um, Second Peter two nineteen, had, I think, has one of the greatest uh, 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 passages about that. And it's a man. And I, I quote it and get in trouble because I use the word slave. Um, a man is a slave to anything that has defeated him. A man is a slave to anything that has defeated him. And, you know, that's tr so true. And, you know, of course, you know, I think about athletics a lot. And you think about a team that loses a Super Bowl is a slave to that team that beat them. You know, um, you remember the 1960 World Series. You know what? You talk to Yankees fans that remember that. They're slaves to the fact that the Pirates won that. You know, uh, five years after uh, we played a football game in high school, but we beat our big rival 2 nothing. I ran into a woman. She was the manager of a place my mother was going to uh, move to. It was 25 years after we played the game. And we beat our biggest rival to nothing. It was just an unbelievable game. And this woman looked and said, oh, you're from Trafford. She said, I'm from Turtle Creek. I said, really? I said, to nothing. I knew she was about my age. I knew she was about my age. And so, you know, I said, to nothing. And she went, <laughs> because they're a slave to it. Now, if we're if if we've got that kind of thing going on just because of ball games or you know whatever, um, how much more so the fact that we are we we are slaves to sin. We are slaves to sin, and why is that? Because because of radical corruption, because of the the, the T and in, in the five points of Calvinism, the total depravity. All have sin, as Romans tell, tells us. And fall short of the glory of God. Now, Moses knew that. 
Moses knew that, and he was saying, you know, you guys are going to be corrupt, and you're going to be exiled from your land. And um, But God provides the promise then that they will return to God and be forgiven. And uh, so God, it teaches about God's justice because why? What does God's justice demand? It's not a penalty. Oh, yeah, yeah. God, okay. And what about discipline? Now, what discipline's a bigger term? It's got a bigger definition than just, you know, spanking somebody. Mm -hmm. But but punishment comes through discipline, okay? But you also learn through punishment. If punishment is not a learning experience, it's punitive. It's punitive. And then, of course, God's mercy. The fact that he's going to bring people out of this slavery that we, that we are, uh, that we have. Any other comments? What reasons are discussed for keeping the Sabbath and where do they come from? We talked a little bit about that, but what what about the what about the Sabbath? What where where does a where what are the reasons for keeping the Sabbath? Let's talk about that first. What are the reasons for keeping the Sabbath? To rest and keep our focus on God. Okay. Anything else? Well, I know at my house coming up, my mother cooked Sunday dinner on Saturday. Mm -hmm. she, we never went. You know, we went did all our shopping on Saturday morning. We spent Saturday afternoon cooking and making sure our clothes were pressed properly for church on Sunday and laid out. I mean, that's just the way it was. Now, is there a biblical mandate about that? Mm -hmm. It must have been because my mama did the same thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. It, I mean, you, it, it tells you to cook your, your thing for on, on, uh See, here, here's what we run into that down at the big year conference one time. Uh, I forget his name. He's the president of uh, one of the theological seminaries. Oh, Jesus. Pipe, 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 pipe. Yeah, pipe. He coming and he, <laughs> and I, but he did. He, the man the thought nothing about having the. Uh, the alarm clock go up on Sunday. People wait on him. He goes out to eat. People are making him his breakfast. And it, it's it, it, it go on and on. Yeah. Like both sides. But there, there's a touchy, touchy situation. Yeah. But I, what I mean is, I, I don't think it says you don't, you can't cook on a Sunday because if, it, if David's been around in the field and they, 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 they got the grain, mm -hmm. if you have someone unexpectedly drop in your life, so I can. Can't cook anything for you. You're, you're. I think you're not doing the right thing. Yeah. Right. You, 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 yeah. Can, you can talk this. Oh part. yeah, yeah. But, but cooking's work. Pardon? Cooking's work. Cooking's work. Yeah, well, it is. But what I mean, yeah. if you have a, you have to well, you know, now, something, you now, can cook something. Now, uh, there is the idea, the concept that if, if something is essential, yeah. that you can't, uh, you can't do. It. For example. A steel, a steel mill can't shut down its furnaces. Okay, so they have to. They have to. law enforcement can't take a rest, especially in this day and age. Um, firefighters have to be available to work. So there are there there are certain situations, and the argument can be made that um, cooking is something that's essential that you do. Now, in the Old Testament, it, they told you to gather. Enough on the uh, the day before uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the day of rest, so that you didn't have to go out and do that. Now that was more work too, because they're going out and gathering 
Um, well, maybe not more work, but <laughs> a different kind of work than cooking. I don't know how many years back, and it's in my lifetime, that you remember that Israel, Air Israel, wouldn't fly on the sap. Boom, nothing come out of yeah. it. And, and through the different, they know they fly, but they, they absolutely would not fly. Sandy Koufax, uh, would, yeah. uh, Jewish, he would not he would not pitch on Saturday. Yeah. And Vernon Law, who is a Mormon, he would not pitch on Sundays. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and, and uh, of course, one of the one of the greatest movies I think that you would ever see is *Chariots of Fire*. And the guy gave up the opportunity to get a gold medal because the race was going to be on. So, so you know, you you make decisions. I think we make it too easy to do things on the Sabbath. I think we make it too easy to do things on the Sabbath. It's like the the, the uh, church. I don't know if you remember if you ever drove on the Parkway going out between Pittsburgh and McGraw. There was a big A-frame church on the right left hand side, the old Presbyterian church. I got to. I worked there for a couple of years. They had uh, a breakfast. And see, they were right on the, the uh, uh, border of the uh, Churchill Country Club. So they would they would have an early worship service just for golfers, you know. Which, yeah, of course, not being a golf fan, <laughs> uh, I, I just I found that a little <laughs> um, but. Uh, the reasons, I, you know, we've got them. We're supposed to rest and focus, rest and focus. Um, and where do they come from? They come from the fourth commandment. They come from the fourth commandment. Well, the people were all over when he came off the uh, scroll for his little guns in his church. He has beautiful stained glass windows. Really, they really are banging. Yeah, there's, there's. He said, "There's, there's a battle back and forth too." Yeah, and his, um, in fact, uh, on on Thursday nights in a couple weeks, we're going to be doing the Zoom class on on Thursday night. That um, is going to look at art yeah. as, from a uh, as a Christian worldview. Um, if if any of you want to get in on that, you can still get. In. I think you're on my list, aren't you? Okay. Um, if you want to, because even though we've been in it for several weeks, um, you can pick up the uh, the gist of it from the. Uh, the only thing that 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 is really background in it is the idea that uh, the secular world has has taken over a lot of stuff. And if you can keep that in mind, please come in. It, we have great discussion. Weldon's a part of it. A guy uh, that was in my youth group years ago, um, who's a pastor, comes into it, uh, uh, John Taylor. And uh, it's at uh, 7 30 on Thursday night. So, so. Well, it's like you mentioned Rudy. I mean, when I grew up in Crowden Baptist Church, we did not go to Rudy. That was sending water for sin. But, but it, then it said, you, you can get yeah. a movie, you go pornographic, but you can have a wonderful movie. Right. Yeah. I, we weren't allowed to touch a deck of cards. <laughs> that, was about, that was about as far as my parents went. But we weren't allowed to touch a deck of cards on, on Sundays. Uh, just, you know, just any other day was okay. Huh? The cards were wrong on one day. Why weren't they wrong on another? Yeah. My, my dad played peanut ball. Oh, Do you play piano? We used to play it. We used yeah, to play it. Oh, yeah. 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 So. It's all one of our places. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to take a look at the time here. Okay. Yeah, two minutes. Good. Well, let's. Uh, God forbade his people from making idols because he is a jealous God. Is that true or false? Yeah. One important message of Deuteronomy 4 is echoed throughout the scripture. Keep your body pure. Be careful how you worship. Moses was punished for disobedience. The Lord is an angry God who seeks vengeance. I'd say D, the Lord is an angry God who seeks vengeance. The other thing. 
What do you agree? I think it's B. B. Huh? Well, yeah, but okay. I'll concede. Bob concedes. We're all, all's good with the world. <laughs> What modern spiritual practice does his lecture address as idolatry? Saint. Praying to the saints. Praying to the saints, yes. Yes, that is, um, you know, having grown up in a, in a Roman Catholic area, we, uh, you know, we were exposed to a lot of these, these ideas. But one of the things I've, that I've noted is a lot of Roman Catholics uh, that became believers, they started to study and they understood they had to leave the church. They had to leave the Roman church because you know they could do it. But breaking free of that, like the example, breaking free of something is not necessarily easy because um, we are like a, we're addictive people, whether, you know, it might not be an addiction to, to anything that we can see, but we're addictive when we're involved in something. So when we would, if, if we would pray to the saints, we could be addicted to doing that. Okay, so, and it's hard to do that. And there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to addiction that goes beyond just what we normally see with drugs and alcohol and and those types of things. We had a man up in Chambersburg, we had a Pennsylvania, and he came to the place brought him a very Christian, strong Christian. But he was a Catholic for about 40 years. He, he would find himself yeah. wanting, wanting to do the cross. And he would say, oh, I'm sorry, I can just repetition. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy to break something, yeah. like he said. Yeah. But you know, Chuck's uh, mother in law, not mother in law, stepmother, okay. Pauline. Yeah. She, I think, had Catholic background. And I remember her saying one time that she thought they prayed to Mary because Jesus was too busy. To yes. Yeah. 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 What is a possible reason for establishing cities of refuge as discussed in this lesson? We didn't talk much about the cities of refuge. So they helped put them in the blood for us. They still disappointed that. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking when I read this. Because I read the Deuteronomy beginning of my year this year. Uh, if you're put in one of those cities because you accidentally hit someone or killed them, I wonder if that has anything to do with the laws that we have now. It does, but again, it's been perverted because historically, if somebody can seek refuge in a church, we're untouchable. Police can't go in and arrest somebody in the church. So churches became a refuge. The problem now is that they're taking illegals and putting them into these sanctuary cities. And it's the again the the, the idea, the theory behind it is good because they needed to break this thing. We need to break that cycle because the gangs do this all the time. You kill somebody in a gang or you, you even hurt somebody in a gang, somebody goes, ah, you yeah. know, and, and it's, that's, that's such a natural thing. When, when we were kids, um, I can remember if somebody went after one of, one of our friends, we would go and try to protect them, you know? Um, so it's sort of a natural thing. But it gets out of control. It gets out of control. Um, you know, if you read the news, you hear the news, you hear that somebody was shot in the leg, you hear through that, that's an initiation to a gang in a lot of cases. Because they have to shoot somebody to get in the gang. So they shoot somebody in the leg. <laughs> but in our court system, it seemed like somebody that accidentally and yeah. killed somebody. Their punishment is not like right. It's not. It's not. It, it can be a lesser. Yeah. Even like this uh, trial in the George Floyd thing, there are different. There, there's different degrees of what he's been charged with that they can consider, and it can be. It can be one of them is simply that you know you didn't intend for this to happen. It was purely accidental. <laughs>
Where do the commandments given in Exodus 20 and those in given in Deuteronomy, how do they differ? differ? More detail about keeping this out. Yeah. Yeah. And according to church history, why was the Sabbath moved from Saturday to Sunday? I think we all know that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, it's interesting to find that, you know, God, as he gave the Ten Commandments, gave more uh, instruction on the Sabbath, and then here it gives even more instruction, more than any other commandments. So, all right, well, let's, uh, how would you close us in prayer? Our Father and our God, we just can't get something good to be coming from you, the true and living God, sovereign, all of you, and sustainer of all life and work. As we opened up with this uh, uh, prayer for you, your, your, we fall so very short. We are so thankful that you are a God, a God of uh, commandments, a God that uh, looks at our heart and, and is rescuing us from the slavery of sin, even though we battle throughout our life. Lord, we just give the glory to you. In Christ's name, I pray for you. Amen.